Good morning, everyone. This morning, we're continuing our series on Gurudeva's writings on the seven dimensions of the mind, and this is the sixth dimension, part two. It's very short. The superconscious plane of the sixth dimension is situated at the third eye or Ajna chakra. The inner mechanism of the human aura, the inner mechanism of thought forms, the inner mechanism of the astral plane, and the superconscious body of light are all within this sixth dimension. The forces and rays of actinic energy the various breakdowns of magnetic energy, the rays of the actinic force fields radiating out from the seventh dimension, and the rays of the odic magnetic force fields issuing forth from the third and fourth dimensions all come together within the sixth dimension in a tremendous intensity. The sixth dimension is therefore the heart of the generative and regenerative function of intelligence of man. Whereas the fifth dimension actually governs all intelligence. Before self-realization has been attained, the sixth dimension can be a fascinating pitfall or an endless involvement for this life. For that reason, in earlier years, I taught devotees to avoid contacting that dimension and to concentrate fully on their realization. Otherwise, they would have become interested and involved in the same way one can get involved in the astral plane of the third dimension and never get far beyond it other than intellectually. Therefore, I taught disciples to establish themselves firmly in the fourth dimension, touch occasionally into the fifth dimension, and then move directly into the very pure seventh. Only after someone was very well stabilized in the non-dual experience of self-realization and the lifestyle of sadhana, then and only then were they allowed to investigate the world of the devas. But then any experience is viewed as merely another aspect of themselves and not as something else, a being greater than themselves. <coughs> well, that's how all of the older monks were trained. In Shum, Sem Shum Bisi Kaif. Skip everything in the middle there. Oh, straight into uh, pure awareness, aware only of itself. And we can see that you know, there are some groups that focus on both of these patterns. Delving into the astral is more the spiritualism, being aware of individuals on the astral plane who don't have physical bodies, being able to communicate with them. Some people are very skilled at that. And if you're trying for self-realization, that can be a sidetrack, shall we say, if you're seriously involved in it. And the same with the sixth dimension. There are beings in the sixth dimension, and we can become fascinated with looking into the sixth dimension and seeing these beings. And that can, again, become a sidetrack because it's so fascinating, we don't try and go deeper. And the idea is to get above that dimension into the seventh dimension and establish yourself firmly in self-realization before you learn more about what's going on in the sixth dimension. Now, however, aspirants are stronger in their sadhana 
They are able to relate to the devas and individual entities with vast influences while simultaneously holding the Advaita principle that nothing exists outside of themselves. And even the gods, the saints and deities are nothing more and nothing less than the highest aspects of their own being. An aspirant contacting deities or communicating with space beings is merely touching into deeper parts of himself that were always there, even when he could not actually make contact. By acquainting himself with the deities, he is drawing forth those profound qualities which the deity represents, awakening from one perspective those qualities within. An example of that is in Rudeva's talk, The Clear White Light, talking about, it reads something like, occasionally an aspirant in meditation may peer into the face of a great master. He should know that he is looking at his own great potential. Well, this is an important point that I, I became aware of through the Yoga Swami groups that I visited in various parts of the world. Over the years, it was all always the same that there was Yoga Swami up on the pedestal, who the great yogi, the great guru, and here we are down here, the simple devotee. And the idea that the qualities that Yoga Swami had awakened in himself were within the devotees was not in their mind. They were always just the, the simple devotee, Yoga Swami was the master, and there was no way they were going to become like Yoga Swami. But that's the idea, that's what Gurudeva is saying here, that we don't want to lock into the idea that this being has a great attainment that we will never have. Because all the attainments are within each soul to be eventually manifested. And we're ready for the stories. <clears throat> These are from Guru Chronicles, talking about Gurudeva's visions of Lord Murugan. One story has to do with the founding of Kadavul Hindu Temple in Hawaii in 1973. A large Nataraja bronze had recently arrived from India, and Gurudeva was wondering where in the building to put it. That night, in a vision, Gurudeva's third eye opened to see Lord Murugan, who upturned his glistening veil, his scepter of spiritual discernment, and powerfully pounded its point three times on the cement steps at the monastery entrance, marking the precise spot to place the deity. Lord Murugan's orders were obeyed. On March 12th, the deity was moved into place and worship began immediately. So for those who don't know, that's why there's a veil on the, on the pedum of Nataraja to remind us of that vision. And it's very appropriate that the place where the deity was put was the front entrance to the building. So when this was in its original form, of course, this wasn't here, the temple, and this was the front steps. So the deity claimed the front entrance, and then the monks had to go around to the side entrance and be the servants of the deity. <laughs> Keep us humble. No, no main entrance anymore. <clears throat> Gurudeva had another vision of Lord Murugan known in North India as Kartikeya, around the same time. One early morning in his small chalet next to the Tiruvati Monastery in San Francisco, adjacent to the temple on Sacramento Street, 
Gurudeva had a vision that brought Lord Murugan even further to the forefront of his order's life. Suddenly he found himself flying with a handsome muscular being around the monastery room. Gurudeva later told the monks that he had asked the powerful being who he was and received the reply, If you don't know, who does? He knew it was Murugan himself. And some of the monks also had visions of Lord Murugan in our San Francisco monastery when the, the Murugan Murti was, was still there before it moved over to the Concord Temple. Then we have two Shum words from the sixth dimension. Ta Ifna. Psychic abilities of seeing into distant places. Ibimcha Shum. One, inner light that arrives without forethought or sadhana. Two, defining the area or point of transition when the experience of inner light comes strongly without preparation while in external consciousness. Three, reaction to numerous experiences causes a shift of consciousness and the inner takes over completely. Sounds good. That's our short presentation. We'll move on to the fifth dimension next time. Wonderful day.